Good morning, PyCon India. Thank you so much for inviting me to keynote. I wish we could have done this in person. However, it's uh, shortly after 4 a.m. where I am. So if you give me just a couple of moments, we'll get started with our keynote for this morning. Okay, let's get started. This is what does it all really mean? We're at PyCon India. It's Saturday, October 3rd, 2020, and I'm James Powell. If you like this talk, you can follow me on Twitter at don't use this code. I give a lot of talks of similar nature, and hopefully, if this is something that you're interested in, you'll have a chance to see more of this in future. Now, I wanted to give you a little bit of context for what this talk is about. And some people have always asked me, why don't use this code? What does this mean? And you might think it's because in past, I've given a lot of talks that were kind of gimmicky or frivolous about small little niche details or doing things you're not supposed to do. And it is very much the case that don't use this code was intended to be a disclaimer in terms of, you know what? Don't take this too seriously. Don't use this code. However, originally, don't use this code was really more about a particular approach that I was taking in thinking through particular problems in order to derive actual practical benefit for myself. And so to give you a little bit of context around what that procedure was, I often do consulting work or coaching work or training work with people who have to do programming but aren't actually programmers. Think a optical engineer or a network engineer or a physical scientist or a data scientist. Programming is a part of the work that they do but they never call themselves a programmer. As a consequence, sometimes they're hesitant to employ a certain degree of technical sophistication, or they're even hesitant to focus on certain details because to them, they wonder, do the details matter? Is this really gaining value? Is this really giving me value in my life? Is it really helping me out to learn all the nitty gritty details of a language or an API or a tool set? It's just a means to an end for myself. And it is very much the case that in for most, for a lot of their work, the details don't really matter. Just make it work, get the results you want, move on to the next thing. But it's also the case that sometimes the details do matter. And I think all of you have had a situation where you've seen some code that was pushed to production by somebody who was a little bit sloppy with the details or didn't employ a sufficient degree of technical sophistication and the work had some failure or had some deficiency that led you to have to go and fix it later or to rewrite it from scratch. And so we know that it's not quite the case that details strictly don't matter, they strictly do matter. What I want to show you is a particular approach that I take where I try to motivate meaning through investigation of the details. And this is really the ethos of why I started with don't use this code. The whole idea is this. If you take a look, a really, really close look at the details and you go as deep as you possibly can, on the way down and on the way back up, you're going to find meaning along the way. And that meaning is not going to be gimmicky or niche or inapplicable to practical problems. It's going to be something that gives you actual value and actual things that you solve or actual things that you have to deal with in your daily work. In order to really show you what I mean, I want to start with an example. And we're going to presume that we're doing some kind of code review. So well, this is a code review example. We've run across a little bit of code and there's some details in that code. And in fact, the details in this code are very, very, very small. And I wanna show you how these tiny details, these almost trivial details can actually give quite a significant amount of meaning and understanding to the work that might not be visible otherwise. Along the way, I want to kind of introduce you to the thinking process that I take, but let's get started. So let's say that you run across a line of code that looks like this somewhere in a code review. There's not a whole lot you can say about this. It's very simple. OK, maybe you could complain about the variable name. But beyond that, there's really not anything that's interesting there. But what's interesting here is instead of writing x's as a list of the numbers 1, 2, and 3, somebody could have chosen to write it as a set of the numbers 1, 2, and 3. Somebody could have cho chosen to write it as a tuple of the numbers 1, 2, and 3. Somebody could have chosen to use a NumPy and D array in order to store this data. Somebody, somebody could have chosen to use a pandas series. They could have chosen to use a pandas array if they were particularly clever and using an up-to-date version of pandas. Uh, 
or they might have even chosen to use a pandas data frame, but it's likely in this particular case, they probably this is a little bit gratuitous. Now, what's the difference between these? Why did somebody make one choice or the other? Does it really matter? Who cares? Generally, who cares? Why did one of the choices that somebody made to use a set here versus a list versus a tuple make any difference to anybody's life? Well, if you think about it, if the goal here was to store a couple of numbers and then you just compute something on them, like their sum, you store them in a the list, the sum is six. You store them in a set, the sum is six. You store them in a tuple, the sum is still six. You store them in a NumPy and DRA, the sum is still six, and you just have two ways to compute the sum, this API and the NumPy API. You store them in a pandas series, again, the sum is still six. You put them in a pandas array, surprise, the sum is still six. You put them into a data frame, the sum is still six. With the small caveat that this doesn't actually work, you have to write this instead. But this is three characters different, and they're characters that you'd find. The, the difference between these two, you'd look it up on Stack Overflow. You'd ask somebody to help you out. What does it really matter? Who genuinely cares? Why does anybody care the difference between these types? This is a very small, very minor detail and a very small question. But as we go through this exercise, I want you to see how this question can drive an enormous amount of meaning and understanding for what Python is about and what these tools are about. So let's get started. Now, our goal here is to determine what does this all mean? And not only what does it all mean, but what does it all mean in the context of things that will actually help us write better code that'll help us improve our lives in some measurable way. What we're going to do is we're going to embark upon a thinking exercise. And this is the thinking exercise that I employ as part of all the talks that I give and as part of all the consulting work that I do, all the training work, all the coaching work that I do. Now, you might look at this term thinking exercise and wonder, well, why does he say think thinking exercise? Why doesn't he say thought experiment? Hold on a moment. This isn't so fancy that we call it a thought experiment. It's just a thinking exercise. So. The very first place we'd start is let's just compare some of these options one on one. Let's compare the option where they encode this data as a list and they encode this data as a set. And we'll make this example even simpler. We'll just have an empty list and an empty set. And so here we have an empty list. Here we have an empty set. What's the difference? It's two characters different, slightly different in terms of uh, I do or do not need the shift key on my keyboard. They're actually the same key on this particular keyboard. There doesn't seem to be anything particularly interesting here, and it doesn't seem to be a detail that if you were to talk to somebody who's not a programmer, they're going to really, really care. Oh, use the square brackets, not the curly braces. Now, one thing to clarify, this is not actually a list or a set. I hope you all were able to catch that this is actually an empty list, an empty dictionary. This is an empty list, and this is an empty set. I hope you all caught that. Now, going back to our example, we might say, well, the difference between these two is the list is a sequence and a collection, whereas the set is a set. And one interesting thing that we're going to see in a moment is what's actually meaningful here about the list is not that it's a collection with a capital C, but that it's a collection with a lowercase c. And when you look at that, this is an even smaller difference than the choice of punctuation that I'm using in order to create this type. Whether it's a capital C or a lowercase c, this is a very small distinction. And yet, it is surprisingly meaningful. Now, what do we mean when we say that this is a sequence? Well, we might know that in the collections module in the standard library and the ABC submodule, there's a capital S sequence object and we can import it and we can say, is a list an instance of a sequence? And Python will say, yes, a list is an instance of a sequence or this particular list is an instance of a sequence. We could do the same thing with the set. We could say, is this set an instance of this collections.abc.set? That doesn't seem to be particularly interesting. It seems to be a formality. It seems to be something that somebody might care about at the edges, but we still haven't motivated why it matters that this is one's a set, one's a sequence. We haven't motivated how does this change my life? How does this help me do anything that I want to do better? We've just added in some jargon and some vocabulary. And in fact, if we try to take this a little bit further and we say, well, hold on a second. It's not just that it's a sequence with a capital S. It's that because it's a sequence, it supports these indexing operations. You have this get item protocol. You can say, give me the zeroth element, the first element, the second element. And in fact, you can even do some kind of subsetting of this data. You can say, give me a slice from the zeroth up to, but not including the first element. That's a little bit more interesting. That's an operation that you can perform on one of these, but you can't perform on the other. But again, somebody who knows a little bit of Python might look at that and say, well, you know, a dictionary is not a sequence, but I can also perform that square bracket indexing. So the, the core meaning here is not that you can do a square bracket after this 
that you can use the get item protocol. There's something more here because it's not just the get item protocol that's interesting, one as being a sequence and the other one as being a non-sequence. We could even maybe argue that if somebody somewhere had chosen to make slicing slicing objects hashable, we could have even do some we could even do something very similar visually and formally in terms of the syntax to the slicing operation on the dictionary. Unfortunately, this doesn't actually work because the slice object isn't hashable. And so you can't look up the key of the slice object in this dictionary. But ultimately, we still haven't gotten to anything that's actually helping us in our day-to-day -day lives. Now, if we look closely at the sequence object, we can see it has a register function. And we could even tell Python to register the dictionary as a sequence. And then we ask Python, is a dictionary a sequence? It'll say yes. And so this sequence object in collections.abc really isn't that particularly interesting. It's answering a question for us that we might ask at some point once we have already determined why is it interesting which of these two choices somebody has made. But just that we can arbitrarily register something just because it has some particular syntax isn't quite getting to what the, what the distinction is here. If we wanted to go even further, we could even say, well, you know what? I can see that there's a sequence and a mutable sequence. We'll talk about this a little bit later. And we could register the dictionary as both a sequence and a mutable sequence at the same time. But again, we're not really getting to the core of what this actually is in order to drive something that is of practical benefit. With the set, we can try the same thought experiment. We can try the same exercise, but we'll see that the answer is a little bit closer to the surface. We can ask this set object, are you a set? It'll say yes. We can say, well, what does it mean to ask this thing as a set? Obviously, it means that it's been registered as a set. But setting that aside, we can say, maybe it kind of means that you have this ability to perform certain operations on this, this operation encoded by the ampersand, the pipe, the caret, and the hyphen. And it's not just that you can apply this particular syntax. Certain things in the collections.abc module, like callable, really just mean, can you apply the open, close, parenthesis syntax after the object? And, and you can see the syntax itself is not what's interesting here. Because you know what? I can ampersand, pipe, caret, and hyphen, an integer as well, but it's not a set. It's that when I do the ampersand, pipe, caret, and, and hyphen, I actually mean something. I'm, by ampersand, I mean, find me the elements in common, do a set intersection. By pipe, I mean, find me, the, find me all the elements, the set union. By the caret, I mean, find me the unique elements on one side or the other, the set symmetric difference. By the hyphen, I mean, find me the set difference. Take all the elements of this and subtract the elements of this, find the set difference. And here we can see, oh, is something a set? That's interesting. Well, it's kind of akin to a mathematical set. Uh, I can perform set-like operations. In other words, if I have some data and I need to figure out from that data, what are the elements in common? What are the elements that are unique? What are the elements in one but not in the other and vice versa? Oh, I probably want to use a set. That's actually valuable to my life because if I see a problem of that nature, then I know what I want to choose. But we're still not quite sure why this list is interesting as a sequence. By the way, when we talk about the set, we can also say that there's another notion here of, oh, there's unique elements. And with the list, we don't have this guarantee that, oh, the elements will be unique. And so if it were the case that we had some problem and we wanted to say, I don't want to worry about duplicates, automatically allied duplicates, the set type would be very valuable for us. But the real question here is, is this meaningful? And I think it, I think it is meaningful that we, we typify this thing as being a set. We can see that there are certain operations that mean something to a human being, that help a human being solve a human problem they want to solve, that help a human being model a data in a particular way they want to model. But we're not quite sure how that applies to the notion of the list being a sequence. Well, if we step back a bit and we separate ourselves from the notion of the sequence just being the indexing operation, and we think about this for a moment, we can say the set isn't a sequence, but the list is. Well. One of the things that's implicit about being a sequence, what makes the list a sequence but not the dictionary, is that it has an ordering, a human ordering, an ordering that a human being cares about. And just like I can say, I have some data and some problem, where my problem is to find the common elements, the disjoint elements, maybe I have some data. And what's important to model that data is when the data arrived, when the data will be serviced, whether this is first in, first out, last in, first out. And so a sequence or an ordering is an interesting property that may or may not exist in my data. If I need to model, for example, something that you might call a queue, then maybe a list might be valuable, or maybe even a collections.deck. If I need to model something akin to a stack, 
maybe a list type is valuable because that ordering principle that I get from it being a sequence is actually what I'm looking for. And it's surprising. In my experience working with semi-technical and non-technical users, a lot of semi-technical and non-technical users actually very much understand notions of, oh, this is a first in, first out, or a last in, first out algorithm. And so when you tell them, oh, we'll use a set here, or sorry, we'll use a list here, because we need that sequencing behavior, it's something that they might be able to understand and appreciate. And so I would argue that the list being a sequence, if we dig a little bit deeper, is actually something that's meaningful. Now, the distinction here is not super meaningful. They're not particularly that common. It, they're not particularly that similar, the list and the set. But you can see through this comparative exercise, we can try and tease apart some differences here. If we want to really drive for a little bit more meaning, and we want to make this even more meaningful, let's take a look at another distinction. Let's try and distinguish the list versus the tuple. Now, I, the one of the reasons I bring this up, and I add this, this example here, one or two reasons. The first is this. I often ask as a benchmark to try and get, get an idea whether somebody really has a clue when they're using Python. I ask them, what's the difference between a list and a tuple? In fact, I ask them a three or four part question. What's the difference between a list, a tuple, and a NumPy and DRA? And I try and get a sense for what their answer is. And from their answer, you can kind of see, are they stuck at the surface details? Or do they really understand what these things are? And are they able to employ these tools in a fluent way? And you can see syntactically the distinction is quite minor. One has square brackets, one doesn't. I could put optional parentheses around this tuple, but it's not a syntactical distinction. Oftentimes when I ask people, what's the difference between a list and a tuple? I get some trivial answers about some behaviors of them, but let's try and go through the exercise in a similar fashion as before. If we take a look at the list and the tuple, we might say they're both sequences and they're both collections. They both have indexing operations available to them. They both have some kind of ordering. They can both be sliced. They're both capital C collections. And I told you before, you know, I actually care a little bit more about lowercase c collection. Oh, by the way, if we check this using the collections at ABC module, we can see, you know, they're both sequences and collections. And if we ask, do they do they support the syntax that we want? Can they be indexed? Can they be sliced? They both can be indexed and can sliced. But one thing that we might notice if we go back to this notion of the sequence versus mutable sequence, it is very much the case that the list is a mutable sequence, but the tuple is not a mutable sequence. And so here we might have teased apart something that might appear to be a difference. One is mutable and one is immutable. And we might say that's the meaning. That's the choice I'll make. A list and a tuple, they're basically the same thing, except one could be changed and the other one can't be changed. So if I need the data to be mutable, I use a list. If I need the data to be immutable, I use a tuple. And I think that's missing a point. I think that's missing the point. I think the distinction between, oh, we have this list, we can change the elements in place. We have this tuple, we can't change the elements in place. It's an important difference. And it's definitely something that will affect the code that you write. It's not completely trivial but it doesn't really get to the meaning because we haven't gone deep enough. And so let's go a little bit deeper and let's think a little bit deeper. When we talk about mutating a list, if we look around and we look at how we mutate a list, one of the most common ways we mutate a list is not by changing individual elements so much as adding elements or removing elements, appending elements to the end. Now, if we were to do a list append operation and it looked like this, and we were to slightly change our syntax and say, somebody has written a function called append and that exists somewhere and that's what appends to the end of the list. I don't think there's a really major difference between these two, these two syntax, very minor difference. Now, if we were to take this syntax and extend it very slightly by just doing one more assignment and then actually implement append, we see something very interesting here. here we have a list, but we're treating this list as though it were an immutable type. And nothing really major about how this code might be subsequently used has been affected. There may be some early versus late binding, live versus snapshot view changes that might affect us because fundamentally people might expect the list to be mutable and they might expect multiple references to all be updated in sync versus a tuple being immutable. And so every time you need to perform some transformation, you're making a copy. But if you think about it and you try and extend your thinking beyond just the limits of Python, you might say, well, hold on a second. I also write a little bit of JavaScript because you know I need to create a front end for the data science reports that I create. And I, and I like to use immutable JS in JavaScript. And in immutable JS, they also have a list type. But immutable JS are all immutable types. And you can see, you know what? Immutable JS probably kind of works like this. What makes the list a list, what makes this list a meaningful thing is not really the mutability versus immutability. It's gotta be something else. 
It's definitely an important characteristic and it's definitely something that affects your program, but there's something more here. Now, if we were to try to play the same game with the tuple, this is the second reason I wanted to show this to you. We could think about this a little bit. Fundamentally, the tuple is some memory that sits somewhere that had to be allocated by somebody and the memory was uninitialized at the beginning and you had to put the elements into it. And so it stands to reason that somewhere inside the CPython source code, there's a way to mutate a tuple. It's necessary in order to create the tuple in the first place. And it turns out that happens to be the function pytuple set item. And it turns out if you look at pytuple set item, it's actually exportable because third party extension modules may also need people to create tuple types to interact with other Python code. And so as a consequence, you can think, well, you know what? It's actually quite trivial to mutate a tuple. Just write a C extension module or write some code in Cython. Call pytuple set item and change the tuple in place. But you might back up there and say, you know what? This is actually quite trivial. You're talking about an implementation detail, and we can't really derive that much meaning from implementation details because those details could change over time. Who knows? Maybe some initiative to simplify the CPython C API might come into play, and we no longer have access to something like pytuple set item. It's entirely possible. And would that fundamentally change the meaning of the code we've already written? I'm not sure. Now, if we were to take this example a little bit further and we were trying to think, well, can I find a way to make that tuple mutable? And can I do that in a way that drives additional meaning? We might say, you know what? I'll define a function. And in a function, I'll do an assignment. And what I'll do is I'll look at the disassembly for that function. And when I look at the disassembly for that function, I'll see it looks something like this. You load a constant, the ellipsis object, you store it to the x value, you load the constant none, and you return that value. This function just happens to return none. And if you squint a little bit and you zoom in a bit, you might look at the store fast instruction. You might wonder, what does that thing do? So you might go a little bit deeper, and you might say, well, in the C evaluator, in ceval.c, the Python main loop, we have this implementation for the bytecode that stores the thing. And you might squint at this again and say, What's interesting about this is the set local operation. And it turns out that set local operation is a macro, it's a C macro. And if you squint at that a little bit harder, you might say, well, that's actually calling the get local C macro. And if you look at the get local C macro, you can see there's something in the C Python implementation called fast locals, and it's doing some kind of array lookup. So what it looks like is whenever you're trying to store a variable in Python, in the end, it turns into an array access in C. But here's something interesting. There's no bounds checks. Because there's no bounds checks, what that means is if you're doing a store fast and you can create bytecode, you can tell it to write to that array anywhere. And it doesn't even check that the index is non-negative, meaning store fast is an easy way for you to do arbitrary memory access. What that means is if you could construct some poisoned bytecode, and in that poisoned bytecode, you could say, don't store fast to an actual place where an actual variable is, but compute some offset for allows us to write to arbitrary memory, and that arbitrary memory happens to be a tuple, you just made tuples mutable. Now, uh, I would share the proof of concept of this. We wrote a proof of concept of this a couple of years back. It's way too big to put onto the screen. It involves um, splaying generators into your heap until you find one that's at the right distance from the thing, and you, or rather splaying coroutines at your heap with the right distance. It's enormously complicated in order to create it. And we're still investigating ways to just take this stored fast and use code type in order to create poison byte code. There's at least one proof of concept of this in play. Now, setting that proof of concept aside, we might say, again, this is really weird. It's really niche. This does not seem to benefit my life. I just want to write some code that works. You are going to tell me that it was going to list in a tuple, and you were going to, you promised me that it was something that would be valuable to my life. You haven't, you haven't made good on that promise yet. Well, let me see if I can come up with a different way. And here you can see why I wanted to talk about list versus tuple. I secretly wanted to show you a couple of different ways to mutate tuples. Let's talk about way number three. We know there's a library called NumPy, and NumPy provides you a data type called a NumPy ND array. And we might not be sure what that NumPy ND array type is. In fact, that's one of the choices that we had in how to model this data. Because that's one of the choices that we had in modeling this data, it's going to be important for us to try and figure out how is this thing different from the types we've seen so far. Now, if we dig around a little bit in NumPy, we might say, well, NumPy not only provides this type, but it has a library. It has things like linear algebra operations. If we dig around a little bit, it has stritrix. And inside stritrix, there's a function called as strided. And it's still not quite clear. We're not even sure what the NumPy ND array is. We certainly don't know what as strided means. But our fundamental goal here is to mutate the tuple. Why? Not just because it's fun, not just because it's gimmicky, but because we're going to see something very interesting here. 
If we were to try and mutate a tuple, we might try and write a function called tuple set item, and it might take a tuple and an index and a value. And what we're going to do is why don't we create a numpy, an empty numpy and dearray? And when we create the numpy and dearray, we might say, tell numpy what you're doing is you're creating an empty array, and what's contained in this array are uint 64s, eight byte structures. Now, it might be interesting for us to think a little bit about what the numpy, what numpy is. Well, numpy is actually a way for us to take a memory view, a view of memory, and to look at it in different ways. And so it's important for numpy to know, is this a uint64? What's the size of this thing? What's the strides? What's the dimensionality of this thing? And that's what Astride it does. It lets you tell numpy, oh, this block of memory, just look a little bit differently. This is akin to something like a ccast. You're not making a copy of some data. You're just saying, oh, an in64, it's actually eight in eights. And you can do that with NumPy because NumPy is just this notion of take some arbitrary block of memory and look at it operations on it. And so what you can do is you can go into NumPy, you can say, hey NumPy, in your array interface, tell me where the actual data for this empty array would be stored. What's that memory address? And it turns out that when we're talking about memory addresses, we have another way to look up memory addresses. The ID function in Python is a way, at least in CPython up to today, is a way that you can get the memory address of an object. Now, does the ID function mean give me the memory address of the object? No, it doesn't. And I can prove that to you very simply. Alternate Python implementations like Iron Python use a monotonic counter for the ID. And so ID meaning memory address is not correct. ID means unique identifier. It just happens to be the case that in CPython, ID means memory address. Now, there's one other interesting thing here. If you know a little bit about NumPy and a little bit about Python, you might know that Python is going to heap allocate your tuples. You might know that uh, NumPy uses raw malloc, not pi malloc. You might be able to guess that any, Python, any NumPy and DRA is going to be allocated in lower memory addresses than any Python tuples, meaning if you look at the distance between where this tuple is and where that NumPy and DRA is, it's always going to be a positive number, meaning you can go to NumPy and say, you know that empty array? I was wrong. It's not an empty array, and it's not an empty array of eight byte int of uh, eight byte ints. It's actually single byte values, and its size is exactly where in low memory the array was, all the way up to in high memory where the tuple was. Uh oh, you told NumPy, now I own all the memory in between these two, and you can tell NumPy, you know what? I was I want you to give me a, a new uh, NumPy ND array called Ys. And what that is, is it's a little offset to right at the beginning of that tuple object that you found in memory. That's just a size four that's a bunch of eight byte elements. And why eight byte elements? Because likely this tuple object as it's stored and represented in CPython has a couple of ints, a couple of pointers, things like that. You might also say NumPy. Give me a Zeds, and what Zeds is is it's an offset into this tuple object, this raw memory layout for this tuple object, and it's the size of, oh, it's the size of the actual data the tuple stores because the tuple object actually stores its its size and the actual underlying references to the things that it contains all in one in one contiguous memory block. When you do that, well, it's easy peasy. You tell you tell Python, or rather, you tell Python via NumPy, take that little memory address where you store the size of tuple, change that. Take that memory address where the actual underlying IDs, the actual underlying references are, add something else in there. And when you have this in place, you can take a tuple that has a little gap in it. It should be 0, 1, 2, none, 4. And you can mutate a tuple using NumPy. How about that? Now, if you take a look at all three of these, they're all very gimmicky. They're all very niche. They're all. It dependent on implementation details. This last one is the most dependent on implementation details, despite being surprisingly safe and easy to do, in part because, unfortunately, not a lot of people use Iron Python. Everybody's using C Python. And in part because NumPy is available on all platforms. And some of the assumptions that we made along the way are fairly are surprisingly common and safe assumptions to make. But even though none of these individually are particularly compelling, I think when you take them in combination, you can say this mutability versus immutability is not altogether that interesting. I can make a list immutable, or I can treat it as though it's an immutable type. I can make a tuple mutable, but I'm not really, really changing how I'm using this thing. I'm not changing what this thing means.
it is the case that one is a sequence and one is a mutable sequence. And it is the case that there are implications to this. For example, if you need to store one of these as the keys of a dictionary, well, the keys of a dictionary have to be something that can be hashable. And there is a relationship between the between mutability and hashability. And it may be the case that if you need to have some kind of structured key for your dictionary, your choice is a tuple and a tuple only. Even if you wanted to use a list, you couldn't. But I want to get to a deeper meaning. And the deeper meaning relates to this capital C versus lowercase c. I told you that these are both capital C collections, but I told you that the list is actually, interestingly, a lowercase c collection. That's where the meaning is. And so the question would be, what is the tuple? It's not a lowercase c collection. It's something else. It's a record. Let me show you what I mean by that. When we think about the thing that we do to a list most often, what do we do? We append to it. We pop from it. Well, what that means is if you gave me some data, and that data happened to be a list, I might not know how many times you appended and popped from it. I might know not the size of the thing. And what I'm going to typically do with this, I'm going to do a for loop. I'm going to iterate over every element, and I'm going to perform some operation on them. Well, because I'm going to perform the same operation, f, on every single element, every element of this, two, of this list should support that operation. As a consequence of that, I can kind of think it's also important that if there's no elements, this code doesn't break. If there are many elements, this code just runs over all of them. And as a consequence of that, if I try and compare this to how I conventionally use the tuple, I might say, you know what? I don't really loop over a tuple and a for loop. I'm usually unpacking a tuple, and I'm doing different things with the different parts of that tuple. You can see in both cases, they're both sequences. They're both ordered. In fact, it turns out even the set is ordered. The distinction that's important between the list and the set was not that one was ordered and the other one was unordered. If you were to iterate over the set multiple times, you'd find the elements come out in the same order. You might not be able to predict it. The difference between the list and the set was that the list was not machine ordered. The set was. The set had some ordering that facilitated fast lookup operations that was decided by the machine, i.e. decided by the ordinal value of the hash value, uh, subject to the open addressing policy of the of the you know uh, probing the perturbative probing hash table implementation or the sp the sp split hash table implementation sorry the non split table implementation since split table was only added in python 3.6 for dictionaries alone but what was interesting about the list was not that it was ordered versus unordered but that it was human ordered it had a human order and it happens to be the case that both the tuple and the list have a human ordering it's just that we're using that human ordering differently we're looping over it in one case and we're unpacking another case. Well, if we try and split that difference and we look in a little zoom, we zoom in a little closer, we could say a consequence of this is going to be that in the list, adjacent elements are semantically similar or conceptually similar because we're performing the same operation on everything that's contained in that list. They all have to kind of be the same thing, right? They all have to be a bunch of numbers, a bunch of personnel records, a bunch of components. But in the tuple, we unpack and do different things with each of the components. And so they're semantically or conceptually dissimilar. And if we think about a Python collection type, the capital C collection type, it is the case that Python capital C collections are always capable of being heterogeneous in type. And even going back before the PEP 484 days, you know, we were always a little bit loose about you know, what the type of something was. What does that mean? Well, it turns out that if you have a list and you're performing the same operation on every element there, it's very likely that every element has to be homogeneous in type, sort of. Even with the PEP 44 work, we still consider, say, an int to be interchangeable with the float or interchangeable with the complex or interchangeable with the bool. But we generally kind of say, you know what, everything in the list is semantically or conceptually similar. And so that's how we decide this notion of homogeneity. Whereas in the tuple, we say everything is structurally, conceptually, semantically dissimilar. And so we'd say this also would typically lead to heterogeneity in terms of the types that are associated with what's stored in that. And so when we look at this again, we might say, OK, that gives us a notion. The list is a collection with the lowercase c. It's just a bag of stuff. It's a bag of all kind of the same stuff. And it's important which is the first thing and which is the last thing. And it's important the exact ordering of the things. But there's not a fundamental difference between the first element and the last element. Whereas the tuple is a record. It's a bunch of fields. It's very important what the first element and the last element is because the position indicates what the thing is.
The first element has some particular meaning that's not applicable to the second or third element or may not be applicable to other elements. It is very much the case that, as we said before, the tuple exists as this immutable type in order to be used in a dictionary. It is very much the case that mutable versus immutable is important, but it's not the fundamental meaning here. The fundamental meaning here is one is a collection type and one is a record. Now, I wish we had a little bit more time for this presentation because we could talk in greater depth about this hashability and mutability thing. This is another area where I see sometimes there's a little bit of confusion. Oftentimes I see people say oh, hashability implies immutability or immutability implies hashability. And it actually turns out to be the case that hashability strongly suggests immutability, assuming one criteria, which is you need some kind of not random or not intermediated access. And it turns out that you make mutable objects hashable very often in cases where the lookup has some intermediation. A very common example would be in a network X digraph, where you're never really indexing, you're never doing a get item into the structure directly. You're always doing some kind of some kind of intermediated access to the elements via you know, graph.nodes or graph.edges. You're asking the object itself to enumerate what is contained within it. You're not saying, oh, just give me this particular element randomly. But unfortunately, we don't have time for that. So we'll go back to our example, and we'll talk about this list, this set, and this tuple. And let's make this example a little bit more specific, a little bit more concrete. Let's say that we're storing not just numbers, we're storing host names. If we were to intentionally make a choice between the list, the set, and a tuple, we could convey a lot of meaning in that. And there could be a lot of meaning behind this. There could be something really there in terms of the choice that we make. It's obviously the case that we could choose one of them, and maybe the code might work, might not work, and it might not affect the underlying functionality. But if we were to make this choice intentionally, there might be something there. Let's see what that might be. So let's take a look at what differences might occur if we were to. So let's take a look at what differences we might see if we were to make one of these three choices. If we were to choose the list formulation, one of the things that we might try to convey to somebody is we care about connecting to each of these machines in a particular order. That ordering is important. Which machine you connect to first and which machine you connect to last is very important. Now, in terms of the difference between the machine, there might be some modality hidden in there. There may be some predicate. You perform this operation on this machine versus that operation on that machine. But fundamentally, they should all be mostly similar. If you think about the set formulation, you're basically saying, I don't care about the ordering. I care about connecting to a machine. If there is a duplicate, I only want to connect to the machine once. Make sure you connect to the machine, but there's no real difference between if you connect to the machine first or last. Additionally, if you use the set formulation, you may implicitly be saying that, you know what, I've got a bunch of different host names. What are the ones in common? What are the ones that are not in common? Perform some set-like operations. And you can see this choice, even though it's a very small one and it's driven around a very small detail, really closely ties itself to how you go about solving this problem and what you'll be able to easily do using the using the structure that you've chosen. Now, if you choose the tuple, as we saw, the tuple is a different type of ordered structuring. It is human ordered, just like the list, but the human ordering has some notion of the different elements being, context being contextually, conceptually, semantically distinct. In other words, it's a record, not a collection. And so here, if you had these two host names, you might be saying, well, you know what? This host name is the prod host name. This host name is the dev host name. Or you might even be saying, this is the primary host name that you connect to, and this is the backup host name. And you may actually do fundamentally different operations. There are certain things that you do in prod that you wouldn't do in dev. There are certain operations you might do on the primary and not do on the backup. Now, if you think about it with this primary backup example, you could also model this as a list, but there's a meaningful difference here. The meaningful difference is if it happened to be that there were n backups, there's some primary machine at the very beginning, and then if you don't hit it, you hit the next one, the next one, the next one, the next one, that's probably a list. But if it's strictly the case that there is a fixed modality of either primary or backup, and you're guaranteed that everybody has either a primary or a backup, and that there is a very stark kind of discrete difference between these two, as opposed to the continuous modeling of the list, well, maybe that's a tuple versus a list. Now, what you can see here is that the details are very interesting because we can dive very deep into the details and we can use the meaning that we get out of them to clarify a choice. We can use these details in order to convey an intention. And so it's very important that we say, if you were to make this choice intentionally, then this is the result. Because it's very much the case that you might not be intentionally choosing between these three choices and your code might still kind of work. It turns out the machine doesn't really care about this meaning. It's the human being that cares about this meaning. This meaning is valuable in terms of what it conveys to somebody else and also in terms of how it helps guide you in the work that you're doing. But ultimately, 
the choice that you make may not actually make that much of a difference in terms of what's executed by the machine. Additionally, it's very important that when we talk about things like this list versus tuple view, this is an interpretation. This is my interpretation. I find that the deeper you go into thinking about the list and the tuple type and the set type and all of the built-in types, this interpretation really holds up. There are other places where this interpretation is further corroborated, but ultimately it's interpretation. And it could very well be the case that you choose to just look at a list as a immutable, or sorry, a mutable tuple. However, I think that you lose a lot of fidelity in terms of what you can convey to somebody. And I think you fall, you find yourself going astray from how these things are typically used in practice. Now, that was a view of the thinking exercise, this don't use this code exercise. You go deep, deep, deep into something, and then you, on your way back out, try and figure out how is this meaningful? Why does this matter? I want to complete this exercise for you. And I want to talk about the other choices that we had. And in going through the other choices, I want to give you a conceptualization of how all the pieces of NumPy and Pandas fit together. And we're going to try and follow the same exercise and the same steps that we did before. And those steps are collect the facts, collect the details, look at as many deep niche details as you can, find differences, look for similarities. But then, but then review conventions and review expectations. An example of an expectation versus a convention would be, convention might be, how does somebody actually use this? An expectation might be, when somebody looks at this, what are they really thinking? Yeah, maybe a difference is here, but does somebody even notice that? Here's an example. There are multiple import styles. You can say import X. You can say from X import Y. You can say import X as some alias. And when you look at those three, for the majority of Python programmers, they don't really see a strong distinction between those. And so there is a fundamental distinction. Import X versus from X import Y is an early versus late binding distinction. When you create that name, are you creating that as a live view or a snapshot view? Or rather, when you access the thing by that name, is it, are you accessing it as a live view or a snapshot view? Is it early bound or is it late bound? Most Python programmers don't really see that distinction. And so their expectation is not going to be, this is a very important distinction. And so for the most part, when you're trying to do things like compare import styles, it's really going to come down to how much typing. And if I'm a data scientist, you know, what other two letter alias can I find for the new package so that I can minimize the amount of typing that I have to do? Collecting all of these pieces, you need to apply some judgment. And this is a very difficult thing to do because you have to really sit back and say, what can I justify? Can I put together a convincing argument for this? You might be right. You might be wrong. There may be a case where there is no right or wrong. And, fun and finally, you derive some interpretation, which leads directly to some meaning. The reason that you want to do this is you want to be able to look at something and say, what is this thing really? What does this thing really mean? And so let's take a look at all of these pieces of NumPy and Pandas, and let's figure out what are these things really? What do they really mean? We've seen the NumPy and DRA already, and we talked about it as a memory view. We said it's one way for us to access some raw memory. And we said that NumPy has the ability to do something akin to a CCAST. You can look at that memory differently. So you can say, oh, this memory is one linear sequence of nine elements. Or you can say, oh, it's actually a three by three matrix. You can look at that and say, oh, you know what? It's a bunch of int 64s. No, no, no. It's actually eight times as many int eights. That's kind of what the NumPy and DRA is. But the meaning goes even deeper than that. Because when you think about it versus the list, it's a sequence just like the list. In fact, it's a mutable sequence just like the list. And when we try and drive a difference between the, the two of them, we might say, well, the list is dynamically sized and the NumPy and DRA is fixed size. But you can make arguments for, well, the NumPy and DRA is fixed size because it represents some raw memory at, at location. And you're not really going to shrink or grow that. That might require a new allocation. Uh, but the list is some kind of reference of some, some grouping of some references of objects. And so, yeah, I can see there's a difference here. But we're still not quite getting to a core meaning. We could say that the list has a fixed shape. It's always some linear sequence where the NumPy and DRA has a dynamic shape. It could be linear, it could be two-dimensional, it could be three-dimensional. We could even say, you know what? The list can only actually ever be linear. And the NumPy and DRA can be any number of dimensionality such that when you multiply out the size of the dimensions, you get the total size of the thing that you're looking at. But there's something a little bit deeper than that. And if you look at what you put into the list and what you put into the ND array, and you think about what those things are and how Python works, you'll see a very interesting distinction appear.
let's say we have a list containing some integer objects. And what is an integer in Python? Well, it's some, it's not like an integer in C or C++ because it can't overflow. It doesn't have a bit width. It doesn't have a sideness. It's not signed or unsigned. If I put some integers into a list and I operate on all of them, I kind of expect each one of these integers to perform the same operation, but we don't really, but I don't really carefully look at the homogeneity of that thing because, you know, if they were, it were two integers and a floating point value, I might very well expect to be able to add one to all of them. And when I look at that integer, I can see, you know, it has this nice auto promotion behavior. It's what I might think of as a boxed type. Unlike in a language like Java, where you have boxed versus unboxed types, in Python, everything is boxed. What that means is the list doesn't store the actual underlying data. It stores references to the data. Therefore, the list is non-contiguous. As a consequence, operations on that list might need to jump around memory, and so they can't benefit from cache coherence. Additionally, because it's a box type, that box type can have behavior associated with it. So that might not be a list of integers. It might be a list of subclasses of integers. And when you perform an add operation on one of those integers, it might perform some stateful operation to mutate another one. And so the actual underlying behavior of these things is unconstrained. This, this dynamic dispatch has to happen at runtime. And what it actually does, there's no limits to that. What does that mean? Well, it means that if I have a list that I'm processing a list, can I auto parallelize the processing of the list? No because the things that are contained in the list have some arbitrary unconstrained behavior. And as a consequence, processing the list from front to the back versus from back to the front might be meaningfully different. However, if I think about the NumPy and DRA, what do I typically put into the NumPy and DRA? It is the case that I could put pi objects in the NumPy and DRA if I weren't worried about things like, I don't know, potential memory leaks from circular references. There's some longstanding bugs related to this in NumPy. And it is the case that there are places where you often do put Python objects into NumPy and DRAs. For example, you know, a pandas interval might show up in an index, so it might end up showing up in an NDRA. But ultimately, when you're usually using a NumPy and DRA directly, what are you putting into it? You're not putting into an integer. You're putting into it an int64. Well, an int64 is an unbox type because the memory for that int64 is managed by the NumPy and DRA. Therefore, that memory is contiguous. Therefore, if you want to perform some operation on an ND array, you get cache coherence. And because it's a machine type, it has constrained behavior. It's an N64. You add one to it, you know exactly what's going to happen. You can't subclass it. There's no notion of any type system there. It's just some bits that have some operation that's understandable by the computer and can be represented without dynamic dispatch as probably a single you know, low cycle count assembly instruction. When you operate in the NumPy and DRA, you can operate on it just like the Python list. You can go through each element and apply an operation, but you typically don't do that. You typically ask the ND array to perform the operation for you. And so you have this distinction in syntax, a very minor distinction in syntax. But what that immediately leads to is the notion that the NumPy and DRA, beyond just being some memory view, is actually a restricted computation domain. It's a way where you can come to terms with the fundamental inefficiency of Python. Python is too dynamic. And it's simply too dynamic and has certain limitations around uh, no ability to control memory layout. And as a consequence, if you need to get certain optimizations out of Python, what you do is you take computationally intensive parts of your program, you draw a line around them, you call that your computation domain, you build a manager type, that's what NumPy and DRA is, that manages everything inside that. Instead of allocating a bunch of Python objects, you have the manager type allocate raw memory and then manage it itself and box and unbox on the boundaries. And because you have control over that domain, you add some restrictions to do things faster, to eliminate dynamic dispatch, to add in optimizations. That's what NumPy and DRA is. It's some computational domain sitting within a bunch of Python code that does program structure. So when you think about that, you can say, well, hold on a second. If I need to store a bunch of numbers, and those numbers are being stored for the for, for for in order to be able to do some mathematical work, some computational work, put it into a NumPy and DRA. But if I'm doing that for some kind of program structuring, like I'm printing them to the screen, or they're deciding some mode for what I do here or there, probably put them into a Python list. Now we can make this, we can draw this distinction even, even clearer. We could say, that if a list versus a tuple is a collection versus a record, a list versus an ND array is a collection, just some opaque bag of stuff versus a mathematical vector or matrix or tensor or something along the lines of that. And so you can think list is for storing a bunch of stuff. 
NumPy and DArrays for storing some mathematical stuff. Now, if we think about pandas arrays versus NumPy and DArrays, we can start to create a conceptualization of what pandas is all about. If we think about a NumPy and DArray that stores floating point values, we could store three values here. And each of these are valid values. We've taken a measurement, one, two, and three. Now we can store another thing that's not quite a number, and you, we might say this isn't a value, a NAN. And this means we took three measurements, and the third measurement was not applicable, was missing, was erroneous in some fashion. So we have two actual values and one error condition. Here we have a modality. The data that we're storing can either be of this class or that class. It can either be a value or an error condition. It can either be one, two, or a NAN. And we have to find some way to encode that. Well. When we're encoding the actual values, the one and the two, we're using IEEE 754 double precision binary floating point. And if we were to try and code the NAN, we'd find that IEEE 754, the bit patterns of how it's stored on disk, reserve certain bit patterns for things like infinities and things like NANs. So if we're talking not about a double precision, but a single precision uh, IEEE 754 floating point type, this would be the bit pattern for a NAN. And this is not a valid value. This is a NAN at some sign bit, and then a pattern of a bunch of ones, and then some payload. It's surprising how few applications use the sign bit or the payload. There's actually very few bits that identify the NAN and a bunch of bits that you can encode a bunch of other stuff into. Now, if you think about encoding this modality, how would you do the same thing in integer? Well, what integer value, what bit pattern would you choose in order to encode an error? Well, you can't choose zero because that would be ambiguous with an actual zero. You can't choose negative one because that would be ambiguous with a negative one. Uh, if you chose like the highest value, then you reduce the range of your integer. And historically, integers have had very limited range. You know, 32-bit integer can only get so big. A 16-bit integer can only get so big. And you really might want that range. And also, historically, people did not encode inside the integer type any bit patterns that were reserved for anything but values themselves. So as a consequence, if you need to actually work with real code and real data that somebody has already encoded and written for you, you can't do anything with integer. And so what happens is, if you happen to put a NAN into a NumPy and DRA that stores integers, NumPy promotes everything to float64. And that might not be what you want. And that might actually result in certain problems, accuracy, precision problems that you have. Well. If you think about this, a pandas array can store an NA type while still being an integer array. And the way that it does it is it doesn't encode the modality into the type itself. It encodes the modality out of band. It stores a mask. And the mask is, is this a false value or a true value? Is this a NAN or is this not a NAN? And it stores the data separately. And if you look at that data, that data happens to actually be a NumPy ND array. And so you can see it's just an indirection on top of the NumPy ND array to allow you to store out-of-band information. What other out-of-band information other than these modalities might, might you want to store? Well, a very common case for the, num for the pandas array would be categorical. You're not trying to store some modality, but what you're trying to do is you're trying to say, let me try and compress the data that I'm storing. Instead of storing a bunch of strings, there's only three options for the strings, store a bunch of integers that are very compact, and then map those integers to those strings because it's some enumerated type. That's a pandas categorical. And you can see how the NumPy, or sorry, how the pandas array makes that possible. Now, if you think about the pandas series, what does the pandas series add on top of the array? It is an indirection on top of an array, but let's ignore that for a moment and think about it as an indirection on top of a NumPy and D array. Let's skip the middle. And if we think about that and we look deep into the pandas series, we'll find a NumPy and D array. There is that indirection. It is that ND array plus something else. And in fact, if we were to construct a series from a NumPy ND array, we'd find that it turns out that it really is just a wrapping of that ND array to the point where if you mutated the, the original ND array, you'd end up mutating the series. This is, by the way, one of the reasons why sometimes things like memory management is hard to assess in pandas. It's not always clear do pandas make a copy of this data or not. And even within the value constructors for series and data frames. Sometimes a copy is made, sometimes a copy is not made. And the API is not always that clear. The documentation definitely isn't clear about this. What makes the series interesting? Well, it's not the same thing that makes the array interesting. It's not that indirection. What makes it interesting is the indexing. If you think about a NumPy and D-Rate, it's a sequence. It has some human ordering associated with it. You say this is the zeroth element, the first element, the second element. But what if you want to address those elements differently? What if you want to describe the position of those elements differently? What if you want to say, give this element a label, 10, 20, and 30, or give it a alphabetical label, A, B, and C? Or instead of giving it the, give, instead of taking the natural number label 0, 1, and 2, 
just swap them around. Well, what a panda series gives you is a lookup modality. And the lookup modality is a distinction between being able to look something up by its integer position. Is this row zero? Is this row one? Is this row two? And some other lookup mechanism encoded in the index. Is this the element with label zero? Is this the element with label one? Is this the element with label two? The pandas index is very, very interesting. And there's a lot of details to it that give you a lot of meaning for how to use pandas correctly. Pandas indices can have hierarchy. They can have implicit versus explicit hierarchy. People who are scared of things like multi-index don't always realize that date time indices in pandas are also implicitly hierarchical. And so there are certain look there are certain operations that you might perform that you might not be able to guess. Does this give you a series or a data frame without knowing a lot about the index? The deeper you go, the more you find that even things like the monotonicity of the index is very interesting in terms of what it will return to you when you perform an op when you perform a lookup operation. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go into this, but maybe if I have an opportunity to attend PyCon India next year in person, I'll tell you a little bit more about the pandas index. Instead, let's let's wrap this up and talk about the pandas data frame. I told you this is a little bit gratuitous. You have a data frame with three elements in it. More likely, you might have a data frame with two groups of elements, two columns. Oftentimes, when we think about the data frame, we think about it like as an Excel spreadsheet. It's a bunch of cells, there's like rows, there's columns. We might think about it as tabular data, but there's something a little bit more to it. And we can really formulate it in terms of the series. We shouldn't necessarily think of the data frame as another layer of indirection on top of the series, because it's not guaranteed to be the case that the data frame is composed of series objects. You can take a data frame and extract series from it. You can turn a series into a data frame, but it's not like one's necessarily built on top of the other. That's not the conceptual structure here. Instead, what you can think is, a pandas series is a notion of having some data and having some alternate way to access that data by some kind of index label. A data frame is the idea of having two-dimensional data and having an alternate way to access it on a major axis and an alternate way to access it on a minor axis. In other words, the index in pandas is an index and the columns are also an index. I call this a major and a minor axis because there's operations you can easily perform on the pandas data frame index that you can't perform on the columns. For example, you look up columns by label, but it's actually a little tricky to look up columns by their position. And in fact, that's not something that's generally meaningful to a pandas. This is column zero, column one, column two. It's not something that people expect to be meaningful. So there's not really an ordering of them. There's just the labels there. And so the monotonicity of the columns is not something that people, and slicing the columns is not something that people typically do. Although I've actually had cases where I wanted to represent uh, breakdown of data. So I had columns that represented geographic regions, and I wanted to be able to do a multi-index on them. And it's actually quite powerful, and it gives you a, the ability to really slice and dice data very nicely. Now, when you think about the pandas data frame, instead of thinking about these silly data frames that just have two columns, let's think about one that has two named columns and an index. And we'll try and see what the meaning behind all this is. Because I've told you a couple of facts, I've told you a couple of details to try and give you a, a conceptualization of what these things are. But here's the thing. What really improves your life is being able to fiddle less with pandas, is being able to get your analyses done quicker. It's being able to represent these analyses more tersely or more directly. When you think of the pandas data frame as this almost geometric structure with a major axis and a minor axis, and you think about all the transformations you typically want to do to a pandas data frame, well, you can kind of think about it geometrically. Do I want to collapse multiple rows into one row? Do I want to collapse multiple columns into one column? Do I want to take the columns and make them the index? Do I want to take the index and make them the columns? And so for example, here, if we think of this visually, we have a pandas array. It's got columns A and B with values 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 at indices X, Y, and Z, index labels X, Y, and Z. If I wanted to take that A and B up here and just pivot them, to be part of the index. I want to take the minor axis and pivot it to be part of the major axis. That's just the stack operation. If I wanted to do the opposite, that's just an unstack operation. Now, when you stack and you unstack, you leave the existing major axis in place. So you're appending onto that major axis. And so you get a multi-index. If you want to throw away the major axis, then you do a drop level. And so here, when I look at this, I can immediately Im see in my mind, because I understand what this thing is, I can immediately see in my mind what happened. You had A and B, X, Y, and Z. You took that A and B, and you pulled it down here. So you ended up with A, B, A, B, A, B, 
and then you threw away the top level. So you ended up with A, B, A, B, A, B. So you have a pandas series with the numbers 1, 4, 2, 5, 3, 6, and the indices A, B, A, B, A, B. And when you think about it this way, you realize all that fiddling and all that searching through Stack Overflow to manipulate my pandas data frames, it really is owing to a misunderstanding of what this thing means and an inability to grasp the fundamental structure of this thing. And so I hope you've enjoyed this thinking exercise. This is the thinking exercise that underlies almost all of the consulting, corporate training, all the talks I give. I go as deep as I can on the way back out. I try and find meaning. I try and find applicable meaning. Because ultimately, it is not quite clear do the details matter. I think the details do matter, but I think the details matter insofar as they allow us to understand this meaning. Meaning is about what as a human being can I derive from this that allows me to convey something to somebody else or make a decision better or allow me to quickly destructure a bunch of details into or quickly structure a bunch of details into things that I really need to know and things that are just things I look up. For example, I understand fundamentally stack versus unstack, pivot versus melt, but all the keyword arguments that they take in pandas, I got to look that up every single time. Does it take it in place? Does it not take it in place? I look that up every time, but the meaning here allows me to say, I know what this thing does structurally, so I know exactly where to look. And then, yeah, I look up the details. I look up, you know, is it a keyword argument? Is it a positional argument? What, what are the names of the arguments? Does it have in place or not in place? Does it make a copy or is it a view? And so forth and so on. Because ultimately, when you're talking to people who are programmers, but only because programming is what they need to do to do their job, they're data scientists, they're optical engineers, they're network engineers, they're physical scientists. The first question on their mind whenever they look at the details or look at technical sophistication is, why should I care? How does this improve my life? How does this give me something better? Why does going into those little gimmicks and these details, how is it not just a dalliance, something fun if I have some spare time? How is this something that actually is valuable for me? And the answer to how this improves my life is, you go all the way down there and on the way back out, you start to see the bigger picture. You start to see the meaning behind these things. You start to see how to structure this information. So it's not just a bunch of details, but there's a clear path for you being able to distinguish the underlying ideas from the details that's, that corroborate or supplement that. Because in the end, what's really most important is what does it all really mean? I'm James Powell. Thank you very much. So I oh, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So James, that was really an amazing talk. So thank you so much for your great insights. So here you have the first question. So how do you structure an advanced conference talk that still suits all kind of audience? I I wasn't intending to do that. What I was intending to do here was to share with you the only real gimmick I have, which is how how do you figure these things out? How do you derive some meaning, some understanding of these things? How do you move beyond just a bunch of details? Because in reviewing a lot of educational material around Python, I found it's often very poor. It just overwhelms a person with facts. And there's no structure behind those facts. There's no meaning behind those facts. It doesn't give them any greater guidance. And so I thought what I would share with you is how you might be able to develop that yourself or some of the steps along the way. And I think that what you often see is when you really have this deep-seated, intuitive understanding of the thing, it's not actually very difficult. Um, one of the things that we do is we have a we have a corporate training curriculum, and it's called Fundamentals of Programming, and it actually goes into much more sophisticated things than the actual advanced Python training that we do, because it turns out that when you talk about you know modalities or early binding or late binding, mutability, immutability, laziness versus eagerness, root level code versus leaf level code. Those are all things that people can actually pretty much intuit. They're pretty straightforward. You can motivate them very easily. And what really traps people is all the millions of little details. If you talk about Python's object model in terms of protocols, you can, within a couple of minutes, figure out, okay, this is how the thing is designed. 
This is how the thing is supposed to be used. And then you can spend the next two weeks of your time trying to memorize all the different underscore methods that exist. So what I would say is, to try to answer this question as directly as possible, I actually think that some of the really interesting advanced stuff is surprisingly accessible to a novice audience if you can find that right meaning and that right structure. So, so the question was, um, an example of code in production where an issue was caused, where, where the code was working not as explicitly intended, but kind of works. Um, what, you, what you should do is you should see if you have any friends who are data scientists and ask to look at their code. And I say that in jest because the truth of the matter is are people who are data scientists or physical scientists or non-programmers really motivated to write good code? Maybe, maybe not. Um, they're motivated insofar as if the code breaks in production, maybe that's something that affects them. But they're not typically within their organization's value. They're not promoted based off of writing the best code. You know, they don't publish more papers when they write good code. And so as a consequence, it's very difficult to really convey to these people, okay, why does it matter? And so hopefully part of this talk was, yeah, you have all these little niche details, all these little pieces, but when you come back out the other side of it, and you look at these things, you say, yeah, it kind of matters, right? If I choose a tuple versus a list that says something different, it means something different, some things are easier, some things are harder, the distinction is actually very clear, very stark, and maybe next time I make that choice, I can make that choice right. And so what I would say is, the amount of bad code out there that's bad because the person didn't really put in the effort or because the person just couldn't write good code is, is not that high. The amount of bad code that's out there because a person wasn't incentivized or motivated to write better code is where the main problem is. And that motivation, that incentive, and that meaning is surprisingly easy to convey and surprisingly easy to get somebody to look at. And so hopefully for any of you out there who are trying to figure out some of these distinctions yourself in code that you're writing, maybe you might be able to get it right the next time. Great answer, James. Uh, we are over time, so I really I'm want so to thank sorry. you. No, no, no. So thanks a lot.